The final step in producing forecasts using the card forecasting method is known as calibration. The calibration is going to take the forecasts produced by delta and rho, combine them, and then build, in fact, a new model to fit to the forecast data as well as the in-sample data. Finally, the forecasts will come from the fitted values from this model. The idea behind calibration is as follows. So we have the original data, y1 through yt. Again, the original data are x1 through xt, but the y1s are simply the x transformed using, for example, the log, or possibly not at all, in which case then the level. And then these are going to be augmented with h, cap h forecasts. So cap h is the largest forecast horizon that we're actually producing forecasts for. And these are simply going to be the average of the delta and the rho forecasts. So for example, if we think something about y hat t plus 1 is really 1 half y hat t plus 1 rho plus y hat t plus 1 delta. So that is all I need to do to construct these augmentation variables. And then what calibration does is it fits a model to this joined up series. So it does include the original data, but it also includes the augmentation from these forecasts. And finally, we'll see at the end that the forecasts themselves are what looks like an in-sample fit, but they are actually out of sample, of course, because the all of the variable in the augmentation, so all of the y hats, they are, of course, real forecasts. That is, they only use information up to time t. They don't use information in the future. So even though these are going to be fitted values of these forecast values, they, of course, by definition, are also using only information up to time t, so there's no cheating or look ahead here. The final model is going to be, at the end of the day, a seasonal AR, but it's going to have some additional features. It's going to have a few different types of seasonality. It's going to allow for structural breaks, particularly in the trend. And these are features that are found to be useful when forecasting time series. A few final preliminaries before we actually see the model. So we're going to have two Fourier terms, just the sine and the cosine. In the notation of the Serimo lectures, this is simply assuming that k equals 1. That is, there's a single component. So this is a very conservative uh, seasonal pattern. It only allows the, sort of the lowest, sort of the least level of seasonality to be captured by these types of terms. We're also going to define a new variable dt, which is going to be a break, a break term, which is going to be t. It's an indicator that t is less than the sample size minus, then we have 1 half, the minimum of 4m, the seasons, or t plus h which is the sample, original sample size, plus the forecast horizon. So in other words, if you have an observation that's sort of relatively early in the sample, you're going to have one trend or one um, intercept for this value. And then if you have the break, you're going to actually allow for potentially a different trend to happen after the break. That's what the break's going to do. It's going to be a trend break variable. So to see the whole model, we're going to need lots and uses lots and lots of indicators. So let's just go one at a time through the indicators. So the first one we have is IRO. This is an indicator we computed at the very beginning of the, of the exercise that we used throughout all the methods. And this, of course, is just used to determine whether we have, need autoregressive dynamics. We're then going to have to see IRO appears here as well. We also have IR. So IR was the indicator variable for a seasonal autoregression. And when we have a seasonal autoregression, we're going to see we actually are going to use what looks like a proper seasonal autoregression. I think I failed to change the notation here. So these should be m because they are the seasonal frequency. So when we have both the autoregressive and the seasonal autoregressive terms, then we're going to include the lag value at t plus minus m, but also the lag value at t minus m minus 1. So in fact, this becomes a proper seasonal regression, but with an unrestricted structure. So they're not actually imposing that these coefficients have to follow the seasonal autoregression, autoregressive multiplier structure. They're allowed to be whatever they want to be. You can see there's one more indicator variable here. We have i4. We go down and look at I4. This is simply that T is less than 4, T is greater than 4M. So in other words, we're only going to include this term if we have at least four complete cycles. 
This is just to make sure that it's estimated precisely enough from data to make it worthwhile to include. Moving along, we see we have seasonal dummies as long as IA is greater than zero. So in other words, as long as we found evidence of seasonality in the very beginning, we're going to include seasonal dummies. If we don't find evidence of seasonal dummies in the beginning, so in other words, one minus IA is going to be one then. So in other words, that is if we, you know, if, if sort of IA is zero, then we're going to include this alternative form of seasonality, which is just to capture a very mild amount of seasonality if it's necessary. And this is simply going to use the Fourier terms that we defined on the previous slide. So one way or the other, the model is going to allow for some form of additive seasonality, either through dummies, in the case of the seasonality appears to be strong, or through a first order Fourier expansion, if the seasonality appears to be weak or absent. And finally, the final part of the model are these so-called trend breaks. So we see we have this variable down here, trend breaks, which is I6. See, I6 is going to be 1 under a few assumptions. M not 24, that's fine. That's obviously something you get with hourly, hourly seasonality on a daily basis. That's not an issue. T greater than 3M, again, assuming we have a large enough sample. And finally, T plus H minus K, where K is the number of parameters of the model, excluding gamma, greater than 10. So in other words, if I have enough data, then I'm going to include um, this trend break. If we take a look at the trend break, again, what we have is we have an intercept, gamma 1. The intercept, of course, will interact with mu. 1 dt is equal to 1. And then my new mean in that period will be mu plus gamma 1. We'll also have a trend break. That is, it allows for a trend specification. That is, gamma 2 t times dt um, i5. You can see i5 means we have to have i rho, and we have to have m in 4, 12, or 13. For monthly data, we'd have m equals 12, typically. And so in which case, then that would be valid. And so we would, we would tend to use it. But it's possible that for other data, you may not actually use this to include this term. And that's it. So on one hand, this looks like a very complicated model. But once we have all of the indicator values known, it can actually be very simple. Because of course, we, the simple specification will become simpler. Many of the terms will drop out. Um, the ones that don't drop out will have lose all of the indicator variables because we'll have evaluated them all to one. And so the calibration model becomes particularly simple. So what we're going to do then is we're going to take this model using the values we computed at the very beginning. So even though some of these values might have changed as part of the algorithms, we ignore that. And so we're always going to be using the values for um, I rho and I r and I a that we computed at the absolute beginning of the process in the preliminary steps. And we're going to use that to define the model that we're going to fit in par as part of the calibration. We then, of course, have these few additional sets of indicator functions here as well. So once I have the calibration, I estimate the calibration on the augmented data series. And the forecasts are just the fitted values of these cap H observations. That is the final cap H observations of the series. So we don't even have to actually sort of make anything that looks like a proper forecast. There's no recursive forecast or anything needed. They just come directly from the model output. You can actually, H in particular, should be a parameter of the model, such that one should actually be estimating the entire procedure separately for different values of H. For example, if you wanted to say one step ahead, six step ahead, and 12 step ahead, one would be using an entirely different model fit for each one of these. Note that only the calibration depends on H. The other parts of the, of the model, delta and rho in particular, don't depend on the forecasting horizon. And so those parts can be implemented. One can generate the forecast for any H, the only thing one needs to do then, of course, is use different augmented sets. So you'd have y1 through yt, and then you'd have yt plus 1 hat, and that's what you would use for h equals 1. For h equals 6, you would have y1 through y cap t, and then y hat t plus 1 through y hat t plus 6, and so on. So that's what you'd get for a, a different horizon. If you had another horizon, you would simply use a different set of augmentation variables. So finally, 
once we've done this, we've got the fitted values of y double hat. So I'll use the notation y hat hat to mean the fitted value of y hat t plus h, or sorry, t plus little h for h equals one through cap h. Then the last thing to do is to construct the final forecast. The final forecast x hat t plus h given t will depend on either the exponential of y double hat t plus h given t if we use the log transform or in fact it will just be equal to the forecast itself with no transformation if we didn't have the log transform. So of course here we can see we're using the median. So there's no correction for Jenkins inequality here. Again this is because it simplifies the ability to produce the forecasts and it's not clear that the Jenkins inequality is accurate especially if the residuals may not be normal. So easy to do there, and that's it. So that completes the entire card forecasting procedure. So you start out with the preliminary steps, then do the delta forecast, the row forecasts, and finally the calibration, which uses the average deltas and rows. So the calibration step uses averaging to combine the delta and row forecasts. The calibration model is a richer model than rho in particular. It's also richer than delta. It doesn't impose all this ad hoc structure, although it does take as inputs some of these very robust forecasts that aren't thought to deviate too far from the truth. We finally use the fitted values of these averages as the forecast values themselves, although we might need to transform these back to the original levels if we had logged the data.